And that's before you start. Yeah. <laughs> that's the easy bit. <laughs> a very warm welcome to St. Paul's this evening for this particular occasion uh, when Bishop Sarah and I are going to have a chat and you listen in, but you also have your opportunity to contribute to what goes on. Before we begin, we're going to pray together. So let's pray. And in some moments of quiet, we bring to God all that today has been about for us and for those around us. We pray for those we've met in need and give to God our hopes and fears coming out of today and the loose ends that we carry. Come, Lord, in your love and mercy. Open our ears and hearts that we may rest in you and learn and grow. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So my name is David Eisen. I'm the Dean of St. Paul's. And um, my job is to look after the cathedral so it's somewhere the bishop can come and enjoy herself. Um, so we try and do our best for that one. Um, for those of you who've not been to one of these events before, let me explain what happens. Uh, we'll start off with me asking Bishop Sarah some questions. And um, as I do so, you'll have the opportunity to be spurred off to think of your own questions. We've had some questions that have come in already, already but there will be more. And you can, if you have a question for her, write it on the back of your program and wave it in the air and some of our lovely wandsmen will come and relieve you of your program and take the question over to our desk in the corner where it will be processed and magically appear on the screen. Um, we can't promise to ask everyone's questions, of course, but we will be looking for what are some of the major questions that people want to ask as we come together. We'll be collecting questions till about 20 to 8. And please, will you keep your question short and legible? Um, and preferably not in green ink. And um, we're also taking questions via Twitter using the hashtag hash Bishop of London. So if you want to send us a question through your mobile, just type in your question and have the hashtag hash Bishop of London, and we'll find it. And, uh, and then we'll see if we can ask it. Sarah is the only dame to have been made a bishop so far. <laughs> uh, there may be more, at least the only one we know about. She's had a very distinguished career in the National Health Service as a nurse specializing in midwifery and cancer care. She was appointed the government's chief nursing officer at the extraordinarily young age of 37, the youngest person ever to hold the post, and was then made a dame for exceptional services to health care, a subject she remains passionate about. Alongside all of this, in her spare time, she went into training as a priest. Ordained in 2001, she spent a spell working part-time in a parish in Battersea before becoming the team rector of Sutton in Surrey. She was a cathedral canon for three years in Salisbury and spent two and a half years as Bishop of Crediton in Devon before coming back to London, where she spent most of her adult life and describes it as coming home. It's the wrong side of the river, Sarah, but nonetheless, we're very glad to welcome you home to London. Sarah serves on the Church of England's National Safeguarding Steering Group, and the Archbishop of Canterbury asked her to write the action plan for change about the prevention and response to abuse in the church, which is a measure of his confidence in her to entrust her with such vitally important, urgent, painful, and sensitive work. Sarah came to faith at 16 and has said that she has found in Jesus Christ both her star and her son in the words of the hymn, and that faith has been the motivation for what she's done, including becoming a nurse. She was installed here last month as the 133rd Bishop of London at a joyful, glorious celebratory service we're delighted to have her as our bishop, our spiritual leader, our friend, and our fellow pilgrim in the diocese. It's a bit presumptuous of me to welcome her to her own cathedral, 
but I think it would be fine if you did. Sarah, thank you. So, Sarah, tell us how your journey here began. How did you come to faith at the age of 16? I suspect I'm not uncommon to many Christians of my generation uh, in that um, I came to faith as a teenager. Most people of my generation did. Uh, and I went to church, not because of my parents, uh, but because of my grandparents. Uh, and I'm often reminded of the, there's a proverb that talks about a gray hair being your crown. And there is something about grandparents praying for children uh, that um, I think is important for us to think about. So in fact, my grandparents uh, took us to church. So I went to Sunday school uh, in uh, Woking and was very grateful for the teaching that I had there. But it was as a teenager, and I think if my memory serves me right, it was part of my preparation for confirmation. And the youth group ran a very simple sort of, you know, beginning to know about Jesus. And so um, I remember it very clearly, uh, but it was in fact a friend, another teenager, who asked me whether I was a Christian. And so I remember very clearly making a Christian commitment. And one of the things we do know is that people come to faith not through priests or vicars, but actually they come to faith, faith through their family and their friends. Uh, so for me, it was this particular individual in a youth group that purely asked me, was I a Christian? Uh, so I remember very clearly making that commitment of faith. Uh, and I couldn't imagine life uh, without Christ, really. Uh, and it doesn't mean to say life has been easy, but there is that sense he's been my anchor. Because, of course, sometimes people make a commitment when they're young and then they drift mm. off. What was it that kept you going as a Christian? Well, I think one of the interesting things is that there is a sense to which each one of us have to recommit ourselves each day and very much, you know, in terms of decisions we make or choices, there is always that sense of recommitting to follow Christ. So for me, you know, it is about a journey and a pilgrimage. Um, and I suppose what's kept me there, um, in a sense, is just always knowing that God has been there. And, and I and I just feel I've been very fortunate, really. And there are times when my faith may have been stronger or less, but it has been a constant feature for me. And I suppose having friends, family who are also Christians has been very helpful for that. In terms of your journey through life, Bishop Nick Holtam of Salisbury said, um, you're a nurse to the end of your fingertips, I quote. And you said you wanted to be a nurse rather than a doctor in order to give holistic care. And you can see how that applies also to being a parish priest, that sense of coherence of vocation, perhaps. But how does that work if you're a canon and a bishop? How is there holistic care engaged in that? Mm. Uh, it's interesting that you choose uh, Bishop Nick's comment that I'm a nurse to my fingertips. He also said that I was a bit like Bodicea. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we can come back to that. Um, I suppose fundamentally at the heart of who I am is that it are people. And uh, I remember very clearly as a teenager thinking about my decisions, about what I wanted to do with my life, was to say, what is it that God would want me to do uh, with the skills and the gifts that I had? And there was this sense of wanting to care for people, uh, to walk alongside them. Uh, you know, St. Teresa of Avila talks about the fact that we are the hands of Christ. So for me, being a nurse was a vocation, was about caring for people, uh, walking alongside them, enabling them to find life in all its fullness, whilst in fact they may not have healing. And uh, so that for me is a commonality that is there for whether I'm a nurse or a priest or in fact a bishop. So at the heart of what I do are people and wanting people to be uh, the best that they can. And of course, as bishops, we're called to tend the flock of Christ. Uh, we're to care and serve the flock of Christ. So at the heart of what I've done, whether a nurse or a priest, the government's chief nursing officer, canon or bishop, is that sense that I want to serve. 
I want to tend people, uh, to enable them to have life in all its fullness. Uh, so it is a, a great commonality. I, I also reflect that one of... Um, you know, I'm all, all the ministries I have have been a privilege, uh, but being um, a ward sister was great training. And those of you here that have encountered ward sisters, either as nurses or as doctors, uh, will know what I'm talking about. There is something about, as a ward sister, how you build your relationship with consultants and doctors. And that has been good training uh, for dealing with uh, politicians and for deans and bishops. <laughs> um, maybe that gives a clue to the question I think we're all wondering about, which is what has Bodicea got to do with this? <laughs> well, the Bodicea quote uh, comes from when I was the canon treasurer at Salisbury Cathedral. The Harnham Water Meadows flooded. And um, those of you that are nurses will know that there is something about being a nurse that you want to fix and to sort things. And nurses are very good when it comes to the operational. So as the waters rose, uh, Bishop Nick gives this wonderful image of me on the back of a, a truck in the works department in salt bags. And uh, he talked about me as Bodicea commanding uh, the group. But it is interesting uh, because as a priest, one of the things I've also learned is you can't fix everything. Um, and I'm often slightly more a Martha than a Mary, and I've learned to be Mary. And the reality is that you can't fix everything, and the nurse in me sometimes would want to. Um, and so that bit about we walk with people in those places uh, where there is uh, often no earthly solution, and that for me has been a great lesson. I know that's one of the things about being a nurse, isn't it? Mm. That you, you cannot always make it better. Mm. And no. you've been particularly involved in cancer nursing, mm. which is particularly testing in that. Um, I mean, how's it for you? And we, you've seen great suffering, people dying and so on as part of your work. What's that been like for you and how has it affected your faith? Mm. Yes, yeah, so my specialty as a nurse was cancer uh, nursing uh, here at the Royal Marsden in London and, and in Sutton. And in fact, when I was in the Department of Health as the chief nursing officer, I worked on a palliative care unit, um, uh, which continued to be my clinical practice. Uh, and I think for me that, you know, the reality is, is I learned the fact that you can't always provide a solution uh, and people would often, in those darkest moments, ask about why and the question of how can a God uh, of love allow suffering. Uh, and I suppose I learned that I don't have all the answers. Uh, and I suppose I also believe that I've encountered a God uh, who is in our suffering. Uh, and for me, uh, God, through Jesus Christ, has done something in the past that talks about a future where there will be no longer death or suffering or pain. But until that moment, we're in a world that is not quite yet. Uh, and therefore, there is suffering and pain. But that sense in which uh, God is with them in that moment. Uh, and I've also learned a lot that actually, sometimes people don't want you to explain it. They just want you to be present. Uh, and for those of you that know about Dame Cicely Saunders, she talks a lot about the ministry of presence, of being in the moment, and not thinking about what has been or will be, but being in that moment. And so often in those places of suffering, we're just called, I think, sometimes just to be in those moments with people and accompany them in those dark places. Has that related to or affected the way that you pray? Yeah, I, I think um, for me, prayer has been a journey through my life. Uh, um, and in a sense, prayer is now that place, not that I so much try and uh, offload all, you know, all my burdens on God and want him to behave in a particular way. It is that place where I encounter God uh, and that place where I am as much transformed as praying for the world to be transformed. And I think I learned that if we pray for something, we hold the possibility of being the answer to that prayer. Uh, and as prayer for me is as much about my transformation 
as it is about praying for the world to be transformed. Um, you've been described on the flyers for this event as a new bishop for London. Um, you've been of London, well, at least South London, anyway, in the past, um, having worked here for a long time. But that's a particular challenge. So how do you think you're going to be the bishop for London? Mm. I think the first thing I ought to say is that, of course, the Diocese of London is not all of London. And uh, the, so the first thing about being a bishop for London is to do it in partnership. So whether it's with the other diocesan bishops, Chelmsford, Southwark. Um, so there's something about partnership. The other thing for me is about listening. Um, and so whilst I may know some of London, I don't know London. So for me, it's about listening and how do we discern the sign of the times and what are the real issues for London and for those people that live, work, have their being in London. So there's something about listening. And then there's something about discerning in what way could I have a difference and in what way can we enable something of God to be known in those uh, issues, those places. Uh, so, so therefore saying, well, what is it that I could do? How can I add voice? How can I speak up? And asking the question, what can the church do for London? What is it that we could do? And how do we establish those creative partnerships uh, to speak something of the difference that we and God could bring? Uh, so listening, watching, building partnerships, speaking up, and speaking out. And one of the key things about a bishop is to be there to pastor mm. the sheep, mm. the lost sheep, those mm. who have no one to speak for them. Um, have you, uh, you've only been here in office a uh, couple of months, but in the terms of the time you've been here, have there been indications for you about some of the areas where you might be looking to investigate more about that? Mm. There are, I think one of the questions I have, and it always sits in the back of my mind, is how much am I the voice, or how much do I enable people to find their own voice? Um, and so the challenge for me isn't just about speaking up on behalf of, but how do I enable people to find their own voice? And certainly some of the areas that I've already encountered are those people that maybe are marginalized, those people that struggle because maybe they haven't completely benefited from our education system. Uh, some of those that struggle with housing and homelessness. Um, so those are sort of some of the areas that I begin to see. I met a group of teenagers from Hackney recently. They came as I was introduced to the House of Lords. And for them, the big issue really is around access to education and around how we enable people to the, make the best of the education that is available. And they have very strong views about how maybe I could enable them to find a voice to speak up around their experiences uh, in, in London. So I think probably the marginalized, the homeless, uh, some of those that have struggled with our education system. Okay, thank you. And um, this is a big job. You are now the third most senior bishop in the Church of England. Uh, there's a lot to do. Um, two questions. One is, why did you say yes to doing this? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> and the second thing is, how can you stop yourself and therefore the people you work with from being workaholics and just overcome mm. Mm. by the tasks you face? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Um, in terms of saying yes, occasionally I wonder about that on, on my moments. Um, and interestingly enough, I very rarely think of it about the th as the third most senior job in the Church of England. And there is a sense in what I said yes to uh, was the call to become the Bishop of London and to be faithful to what I heard as that calling. Um, and many of us will know, those of who have sought to discern God's will, will know that discernment is not straightforward. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily don't think there are right and wrong answers. You know, there is something about how do we discern what God is calling us to do. And so for me, discernment started well before the yes. Um, and some of you may know that the process for a, a new bishop um, isn't always straightforward. You don't apply, you get asked 
to apply. And so from that moment, I suppose I began that process that many of us will have done, to pray, to read scripture, uh, to take the counsel of friends that you can trust confidentially. And of course, there is the piece about looking at what are my skills? What do I believe God has given me as my gifts? Uh, and I, honest, I often believe that God will not call us to something that we're not able. He'll never call me to be a football player, I can assure you. That is not my gifting. Um, and then there's that moment where I, I suppose I felt, well, having looked at what London was asking for, knowing what my experience had been, the gifts that had God had given me, there was enough of me to say, well, actually, maybe God is calling me to do this. And that part where I thought, I'm not sure I have this, is that moment where actually you have to depend upon God. Uh, almost it's the God space. Um, because I think if I was to feel I had everything, I would be naive. Uh, and it's that moment where you rely on yourself and not on God. And I think for me as well, there was the reality that there was quite a lot of noise that said they wouldn't appoint a woman to London. And so for me, that discernment process, I all, you know, going through it, I almost got to the moment where I felt, well, actually, if this really is of God, they would ask me. And so therefore, at that point, I'd gone through quite a lot to know that when I was asked, actually, to be faithful to God, I had to say yes at that moment. And now you're here, how do you sustain it? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and there are those moments where I look and think, my goodness, uh, you know, what is it that God's calling me to do? And so the first thing has to be for me to attend to my relationship with God. So with all of us, whatever our vocation, whatever our calling is, our first responsibility is to tend to our relationship with God, to enable us to have that rhythm. Um, and then I think there has to be some discipline that we put in. You will know that the work is never done. You, we will never be complete. So how do you put in place things that look after ourselves? So days off, ensuring that we see our spiritual directors, that we put in place coaches or mentors, cell groups, uh, you t put in your retreat, you keep to your prayer life, your discipline, you work out what it is that feeds you, whatever it is, and you put in place those things. And I guess that um, for me, a good, I suppose, measure of that is that my husband will tell me when I've got it wrong. <laughs> Uh, he's not backward and coming <laughs> forward, is he? No, he's not. That's great. I mean, talking about the size of the job that you have, you are in the middle of three of the big headline issues that the church is facing. So you're the number two bishop in the Church of England for safeguarding. You're the first woman bishop in London for gender. And you're chairing a teaching document group looking at the social and biological aspects of sexuality and also a member of the Bishop's Reflection Group on Sexuality. There are some links between these, but they are huge issues, each one in their own right. So how do you hold yourself together in relation to these? And where do you look for wisdom in dealing with the people you encounter in ga engaging with these issues? I think the first thing that you're right in saying is that these are very big issues. Um, and I guess that in terms of having agreed to take my role in some of these areas, is the first one to realize is that we can't ignore them and we have to uh, confront them. So that's the first thing for me is difficult issues should not be avoided. We have to deal with them. Uh, and one of the things I've learned in terms of my gender and being a woman priest is that actually you have to have those conversations with people, uh, particularly those that maybe do not accept uh, my ministry. Uh, we ha you have to have them because that's the only way you'll find a way of working together respectfully and grace graciously. So the first thing is you can't avoid them and I think that's important. The second thing that you raise rightly is that these aren't projects. 
Uh, they're not programs. It's not even a working document or a teaching document. It is a process by which we should be seeking God's wisdom. And for me, it is about God's wisdom in these difficult areas. And also for me is that I suppose I, for me, I enjoy problem solving. Um, and, I, and for me, there is something about the exploration of an area, that faithful exploration of areas. And so for me, I don't think you can necessarily preempt pro these, um, you know, the processes that are going on. You can't, I, for me, you can't preempt the answer. And sometimes we have to hold things in tension. And for me, I hope that with all these difficult areas um, is that we need to be gracious, uh, we need to be respectful, we need to realize that the heart of all of these things are people uh, and challenges for them. And therefore, we need to be kind to each other. And so if in terms of how I hold myself together, one is, I suppose, the responsibility to solve these is not mine, it's God's. And for me, I just want to seek wisdom from God. And therefore, sometimes it's about being honest about where we go, when we go through some of those areas where we're just trying to find our way. Um, we were talking uh, before we came on out there about what it feels like to be saying something, aware that... Um, to use the phrase the police use, anything you say may be taken down and used against you. <laughs> He's um, taking notes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I want to move on to the first question from the floor, if I may, which says, in a role like this, how do you decide when to say what you really think or keep it to yourself <laughs> for the time being? Yeah, there we go. When, when people ask me what can they pray for, for me, uh, I have asked for the wisdom of words uh, because I do believe people are listening to my every word. And some of you will know, some of you will have spotted it, if you didn't know, that I have dyslexia. And so whereas people do this wonderful art of shaping words, I sometimes muddle through with words because my, you know, I slightly think differently. Um, and so, therefore, my words aren't always well selected and chosen. So, wisdom of words I pray for. But on the second part is that some of you around the announcement will have heard that, you know, at the heart of who I am, there's a bit of me that's a civil servant. So, I do think very carefully about what I say. But often what I say is that what I believe. So, the truth is you get who I am, really. Um, and um, so you, you do see who, are, who I am uh, in that way. But there is no doubt wisdom of words is important. When people want to use my words, often to create schism. And actually, the focus of a bishop is the focus to be a focus of unity. And maybe that's one of my biggest challenges. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you two more questions from the floor uh, together. Um, the, the first one has come in from a number of people. Mm. It's, uh, what is the good news of the love of God for same-sex couples in England who want to seek God's blessing for their marriage from their parish church? And the other question is, Theresa May said the naughtiest thing she ever did was running through a field of wheat. What's, <laughs> what's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? So something personal, but also particularly that what question, what's good news for same-sex couples who look for a blessing from their church? Well, I think, you know, what's the good news? Uh, the good news is, is the, love of, the love that we find in Jesus Christ. Um, for me, the good news has to be, you know, the personal thing that, you know, what Christ did for me enabled me to have a relationship with God. And therefore, that love I experience is not anything about me, it's about God. That, that is at the heart of the good news. And of course, you, you know, you'll know because of the question you raised around those three big areas that the Church of England is going through a process of reflection around um, you know, the issues of, of human sexuality. Now, at the moment in the Church of England, 
uh, churches are open to be able to say pastoral prayers for people. That's what we're able to do. Uh, but there is a process of reflection um, at this present moment in time. And as I said in terms of my answers, there needs to be prayer for wisdom. And that's where we are. So in terms of good news for people, th there is a possibility of coming to church and being prayed with, prayed for? There certainly at the firm, moment yes. is the possi possibility for uh, pastoral prayers. That is what uh, informal pastoral prayers, that is within what is uh, being offered. Um, and I would, you know, the, London is a very diverse diocese. People will know that. Uh, and that there is that full diversity within London. And I've often said that what I believe is that within that diversity, uh, people can find a spiritual home in London uh, within the love of God. Okay. And the naughtiest thing you've ever I done? Don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what the naughtiest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I, can I think about that one and come back to it? Okay, well, we'll make a note, remember, <laughs> no. before we get to the end. Maybe you should ask my husband. Um, <laughs> and another issue that's, that's come up uh, from more than one person is about uh, how the church in London can engage with and help tackle the issues of knife crime and gang culture, which is a very pressing issue at the moment mm. in the capital. It is. Um, I have begun to take the opportunity to begin to talk to people involved in the challenge of knife and gun crime. And Cressida Dick talks about it as being a public health issue. Um, and I think I'd probably agree with her that it's about looking behind the, the guns and the knives to say what is it that is the real issue. And if you talk to those involved with the youth in London, they talk about the need to collaborate together. Um, so people coming together, uh, churches, community groups, the police, health services, social services. And you do begin to see that there are parts of London that are beginning to do that. So I think the church needs to play a role with that and how they begin to create or build on where we've already got community involvement to understand the issues behind why it is happening. And then how do you work with communities to resolve some of those challenges that we face? So there is no doubt churches are already involved with communities on this issue, and I would encourage them to continue to do that. Okay. Another question about you, but it's in relation to you about others, which is, have you ever had doubts about your faith? And what would you say to those who want to believe and yet still doubt? Mm. Interestingly, um, people often speak to me about the fact that they would like to believe and they don't. Uh, and when I talk to them, um, often I just explore with them what has been their, already their experience of faith. So how have they encountered it? So in a sense, I don't give them any necessary answers, but explore with them their understanding, and then I share something of my own faith story. And, and I often think of um, faith as almost that step into the unknown, and you have to take a step to, to know what is the other side. And one of the images I've often used about steps of faith is we went some years ago on holidays to Slovenia. And those that know me will know that I'm pretty risk averse. And in this holiday, we went uh, canyoning. And I don't know how many of you have been canyoning, apart from my husband. And um, canyoning is where you walk up wonderful mountains. And the way you come down is via waterfalls. And it's almost like those sort of natural water flumes in swimming pools. And so you climb up and they give you a hard hat. You have a wetsuit, a life preserver. And at some point, you have to come down this water chute. You then drop off the end into this huge cavern of water. Now, being risk adverse, when I went, I checked the company. I checked that nobody had died. I then, on the way up, checked whether I thought my instructor was as confident, could I trust him? 
could I, you know, did I think that he was, you know, reasonable? Uh, I checked as much as I could, my life preserver and my hard hat. And I watched people go off the other side. And I have to say that there then came that moment, regardless of all the checking I had done, I had to step off the water chute. And that for me is a step of faith. And so often I'd tell that story and just leave it with them. Uh, because my belief is that you can rationalize it, you can watch other people, but at some point, like I did at 16, I have to say, actually, I'm going to trust this and this faith. Um, so that story. So for me in my own life, I don't know that I've ever... I'm not, there are clearly moments when you doubt, but I've always had a sense that God is there. And there are questions that I have for God. And there are times like Job, I've cried out to him and like the psalmist. But for me, there is a sense my faith has just been there like an anchor. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this is a question about both gender and the Bible, which is I'm sure something that you've come across. And this, this question about you as a woman, I remember you standing in the pulpit there um, when you were installed and talking about uh, from your perspective, what it felt like to be a person who is actually... Oh, no, it was your um, press conference. Uh -huh. um, that you pose the question about gender because you are a woman. It's not mm. a theoretical question. Mm. It's a very yeah. genuine, real question for you. The question is that some leaders are convicted that a man should be leading the church as bishop and state that it's biblical. That Christ is the head of the church, what Timothy says, and so on. Um, and how do you answer that, both for yourself, but for those who are sort of thinking, is, where do we stand with this, and how do we interpret mm. the Bible in mm. relation to it? Mm. I think the first thing to say is that for those who have a conviction uh, that, uh, of a headship or a sacramental ministry, that my role is not to convince them any differently. I respect that they have done the, their theological rigor on it. Uh, and so I have not ever felt that that's my responsibility to change. I respect their views, and I'm uh, very clear about that. I think the bigger challenge are for those people that maybe aren't sure, or those people who have never really considered the theology of it, uh, because often they will just take it as read from somebody that they think in leadership. So there is something about us doing our own work on it. And so I think there is, from my point of view, I think I can work through scripture, and I think there is uh, evidence that there are within the Bible women who have been in leadership positions. One of the challenges for us is that we uh, read the Bible as the word of God, but it has some uh, historical and contextual nuances in it, and one of our pieces of work is to discern through that. So I think there is a, evidence of women, whether in the Old Testament or women in the New Testament, uh, that would have been in leadership positions. Uh, and not least that the way in which, for example, some of the women with Jesus, the women at the tomb, the language that is used talks about them being disciples in the same way as the disciples were, and that uh, command and commission to go out. Um, so for me, I think there is clear scriptural understanding that allows me to take on this role, but I recognize that there are people who would have a different theological posi position to that. And when you were younger, um, I mean, I think back to my own mm. young days when I've been taught this is how it is, and you have to grapple with that. Mm. Has there ever been a stage for you of grappling really individually there with that is. question? So, uh, I, in fact, the church where I came to faith, um, although I may not have recognized it then, uh, has, has a, now a headship theology. Uh, the church that didn't send me uh, had a church ship, a headship theology approach. So in the time when I was in my formation and grappling with going forward to ministry, uh, those in leadership positions would not support my ordination as a woman. So therefore, the way I was formed was within a theology of headship. And so for me, there was a period of discovery around understanding scripture. Uh, and I think it is fair to say that, um, that still within our society and within those parts of the church that, that would accept women 
in leadership positions and within my own subconsciousness, there will be times when I perceive leadership as white and as male. And we have to recognize that within ourselves. So, so I wouldn't, you know, I think we have to be absolutely honest with that. And that would still be true, I think, within the church. If any of us think of leadership, we'll think of white and of male. And that has to, we have to take the responsibility to change that. So there is no doubt I grappled with it. And I recognize that I inherently have been formed out of that. And therefore, that will leave me sometimes with a preconceived idea. And we have to challenge that. And that relates to one of the other questions that's come in, which is, uh, London is a multicultural, multi-faith or no-faith city. Mm. So how do you relate to these predominantly non-Christian people and people from very different backgrounds? Mm. Mm. Interesting enough, um, last week I was at a youth ifta, uh, which is uh, breaking the feast of Ramadan, and there was a whole range of other faith uh, groups represented. And one of our discussions we had was around the importance of interfaith dialogue. But one of the challenges, I think, for those young people is that they were amongst people of faith. So although they were different faiths, they had a common, there was a shared understanding of language. Much harder, I think, is then the dialogue of those of no faith. In what is a society, I think, that we have seen arise in religious hostility. Um, and so for to engage with those of no faith as the Bishop of London is just as important. So for us to engage with leaders is really important. For them to get an understanding, not just of our faith, but what is it that we add to the common good in London? And how actually churches are at the center of so many activities, whether it's food banks, or whether it's you know, credit unions. Um, and so the church is there providing uh, community resilience, community cohesion. And, and there was a, a recent survey uh, that's, that asked people about whether they thought churches were relevant. 80% of church leaders thought they were relevant to community. 30% of community leaders thought churches were relevant. And so there is something for me that we should not take our position as the established church lightly, that we actually have to earn respect in the community and demonstrate our contribution. And for me, one of the, I suppose, one of the biggest responsibilities I feel is in the House of Lords. Having been introduced into the House of Lords, I'm now the Lord Spiritual. That is a huge privilege and responsibility uh, where there are, is limited representation by other faith groups. So how am I going to use that? Okay. Um, when you were appointed, you said that you hoped that survivors of abuse would flourish. And the whole safeguarding mm. issue is a very key one for you, as we know. Um, how do you think the church can treat survivors better in future? And how those changes, what changes there need to be to make a real difference to that? Uh, for me, safeguarding is at the heart of the gospel. I know in the parishes, sometimes people feel it's about more ticks, box, health and safety. For me, it isn't. And I've, I've said, you know, for me, in God, I have found my safe rock, my place of safety. Uh, and I believe that, you know, Christ uh, offers uh, that sort of shelter for people. And therefore, as the church, we ought to reflect that. And we ought to be a place of safety, a place where people can come. Uh, and I think that it has, for me, it is a personal sadness that the church has not been that place in the past, uh, both through uh, clerical abuse, but then when people have disclosed, we have not treated that well. So in a sense, we have abused again. Um, and, I, it, and for me, it is about structural change and it's about cultural change. And sometimes getting the structural stuff is easier than the cultural change. And what do I mean by cultural change? Well, I think what we have to do is recognize that there are uh, power in the church and we have to make sure that we don't abuse that. 
um, and that we have to recognize that people uh, are at times vulnerable and we have to protect them in that way. Um, and there have been, you know, I think some of the changes over the last two years have been quite considerable. Um, we will all, you know, you, you and I will have all been on very different training uh, that enables us to better understand disclosures. Uh, you know, the large number of training going on of clergy and of volunteers, huge changes. Um, each diocese would have been audited by an independent body. So changes have happened. But I also believe there is room for more change. And I think the question for me is, what does the church look like, actually, if it can do this well? If it doesn't only just enable people to disclose, but it enables people to flourish. And so that we can be a place not just for the church, but actually for society. And I think we've got a long way to go. We have to, have to listen to survivors of abuse better, involve them in what we're doing better. And that's not always easy, uh, and it won't be easy. So we've come a little way, we have some way to go. But there's another side to that question about a safe church, which applies both to the way we treat each other, uh, but also one of the things that's been coming through, there are a number of clergy here, I guess, from some of the questions we've been having. And one of the questions around that is about how clergy can cope with the pressures on them. And that also relates to the safeguarding issue because not just clergy, but also laity and a, a church where you feel we have let people down, that we're not doing very well. How can we improve the way that we operate in this? So you're seeking to be a good cleric, to love people, to work with a sense of mm. nagging at the back of you. We're really not doing this as well as we should. Mm. So how can the church be a safe place for everyone, mm. including those at the heart of its mm. congregations? Mm. I think what you raise is a very good question about the pressure on clergy. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious that um, being an ordained member is often isolating. People project a lot of things onto us uh, and um, sometimes it's, um, it's hard to ask for help. So I think for me, there's something about how we ensure that we train in, that we select clergy, we train them to be people who are collegiate, who are used to working in teams, who are people who know how to put in place things that support them, mechanisms to help them, to know that it's not a failing to ask for help and to ask for support. And, and the other part we've sort of not touched on is of course the parish church is not just the ordained person. You know, churches are made up of more lay people than they are ordained. So how do we enable, make sure that our clergy are people who develop and work in teams and enable our lay people to flourish as well? So actually there is more support than an isolated individual. So there's something about building good, healthy communities. And we know that's about good training. Uh, we know that's about enabling people to be good team players and it, it, it's about enabling people to get the right support and help them and so there's a sense in which you know we talked right at the beginning that I see my role as tending the flock of Christ so how as Bishop of London do I ensure that we're tending our flock that in place are those right mechanisms to support people that enable them to provide safe environments for everybody. And the heart of some of these issues we've been talking about and one encounters in church congregations as in other human systems is that question of power mm. and the use and abuse of power. Now you are in what many people would think as, of being as a very powerful <laughs> situation in terms of the access that you have mm. to some of the levers of power. But you talked earlier on about not speaking for the voiceless, but giving the voiceless a voice. Mm. So in relation to where you sit in the structures, how can you help the structures themselves, whether it's the House of Bishops or the House of Lords, or, or the way that churches and their organizations work, to be listening out for the voices of those who don't have a voice? Mm. 
I, I think for me that is, I think that's very, it's the, it, I suppose it's a question that I struggle with. And that's partly because um, a lot of the structures that we work with at the moment, at the heart of the church, is that sense of service. So at the heart of any service um, for those that are ordained as deacons is that image of washing feet. And I've often used that as an image that is a constant for me around service. But I also know that washing feet, the power can be on the other way. So as a nurse, Washing feet is something about giving respect and dignity. But if the person is unconscious, the power is with the nurse. And so sometimes that t table turns, that you may talk about service, but suddenly you become the person with the power. And so there is something about, I see my role that has been and continues to be, is to try and raise the point at which we see that power imbalance. When does that power imbalance occur? And how then should we become, the word that people use is sort of co-producer with people. How do we say that rather than talking about people, we work with them? And so part of my role within, for example, the House of Bishops is, I suppose, I see myself, is to say, actually, we need to find that we hear that voice, that we just don't become the almost the transmitter of what we think the voice is. How do we find the opportunities to have more of those voices in the room? Um, and so you know, safeguarding is a really good example. So one of the pieces of work that I've done with Church House, that they've done with survivors, has been to put material together that goes into those training programs where it gives the voice of survivors. Um, and that was shown at the last General Synod. The next stage is around how we get people to voice into that directly, but you have to do that carefully. Yes, and that, that's the thing that worried me at General Synod mm. when I saw that presentation, was that it was a very moving presentation from people about mm. their experience. And the Synod sat there and then carried on and didn't okay. quite know how to respond appropriately yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, because that means doing things in a different way. Yes. I'm mean, like bringing yeah. survivors into the debates of the House of Bishops actually to be there. Yeah. Um, do you think you can help that happen? One of our questioners reminds <laughs> us that in your sermon, when you came here, you said you wanted to be subversive. In fact, you are a subversive person just by who you are. Uh. How are you going to subvert it? <laughs> um, well, I think probably, I think if you were, um, I think if you were to talk to people, I think probably there have, I already have begun to do some of that. But I think what you have to realize that fundamentally, the way I work for change is to be collegiate. So, uh, and what's interesting, people will know, because you would have read it, that there are some survivors who feel I haven't found my voice on this issue, that I'm not aggressively spoken out enough of this. The truth is I have my voice. And the way my voice works is that I am fundamentally collegiate. So I will work with my colleagues and I will challenge them in a way that uh, is provoking and encouraging change but is in a, in a way that is with them and alongside them. Because the challenge is, if sometimes if you're too noisy from the, the outside, people no longer listen to you. And the challenge for me is that if I work with them collegiately, how do I find those opportunities to get people to put their own voice into that situation in a way that is empowering them and not disempowering. And interestingly enough, about the general synod debate, I think it's an interesting point, is that I don't think people did know what to do with it. And part of that is that the NSPCC's figures are that by the age somebody is 24, one in four would have been a victim of abuse sexual abuse. And so therefore, it's the same with a lot of these items. We're not talking about them, we're talking about us. And therefore, one of the challenges that these difficult issues raises is about the fact that we are talking about them in environments where people are actually affected by them personally. And I think we need to get better at looking after ourselves and each other's when we raise them. And, and so one of the things I always say, that if 
we've touched on difficult topics like we have tonight, people should look after themselves and speak to somebody if something uncomfortable has raised. So there, you're absolutely right, we need to find a different way of doing things that maybe is outside some of our structures. And one of the big challenges for me coming to London is how do we do things differently, particularly around this safeguarding area? How do we hear the voices in London of survivors of abuse? I don't um, know the answer. No, but it's something to explore. And mm. My excellent researchers over in the corner have dug out the fact that when you were a parish <laughs> priest, you said you enjoyed a book by the academic Charles Handy, who works in leadership and economics on leadership, The Elephant and the Flea, <laughs> talking about big organizations who are big, strong, slow, thick-skinned and powerful, and then fleas on the outside who are frisky, agile, vulnerable and irritating. And you said that you saw yourself as more of a flea. So how can you be a bishop and a flea? Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, there's first a warning in this. Be careful what you put on social media. <laughs> Somebody will find you out. Um, the second thing to say is that what I wrote this, there's always a bit about, isn't there, when do you write things? And you're right, I wrote this as a parish priest. So I had come out of the NHS and the Department of Health, uh, which um, you may reflect is the big elephant with thick skin and slow to move. Um, and what I learned, part of that period is what I learned is that as a parish priest, uh, you can be quick and flight of step. And one of our challenges in the church, as it was in the health service, that if you want to change the whole thing, it is quite slow to move. And actually what you have to realize is most change in places occur at the front line. And actually if the Church of England is going to grow, it's going to be because of parish churches growing. If you go back right to the beginning, most people come to faith through friends and families. How do we encourage people locally to have confidence to talk about the gospel? And so most growth, I believe, comes from those people who can innovate and move quickly, which is partly why I think church planting has been so successful. People on the edge, moving quickly, asking forgiveness and not necessarily permission and so moving in those quick ways. And I guess in terms of being a bishop and a flea, I suspect there are those that will say I'm irritating. <laughs> and, um, and maybe there's a sort of, uh, maybe what I need to do, and I risk saying this, maybe what I need to do is encourage fleas. <laughs> <laughs> Can we turn to uh, what's a more pastoral question, but that may find echoes with a number of people in this uh, cathedral? The person says, I'm grateful to God for the good things that happen to me, and we are the good things we receive. But a friend once asked me, how can I believe that God is doing all these things for me when people much less fortunate than me are starving? How would you answer that? Uh, yeah, I am. Um, well, it's a tough one, isn't it, really? Um, I suppose that... The, the, the issue for me, it, I go back, I think, to the point that, um, you know, in The Lion and the Witch and the Wardrobe, they talk, don't they, about that time. You know, it's forever winter and never Christmas. And then when Aslam comes, the first sign is the beginning of um, the melt and the return of Father Christmas. And there is that sense in which we're in that time, aren't we? where Aslam has returned, but it's not, you know, and it begins to melt and we're not quite there. So I think for me, there is this world in which, you know, there is still suffering and there is still pain. Um, and that is where it is. And I suppose for me, I have a relationship with God. And for me, that relationship, um, you know, I suppose I see those things that happen with me as being a blessing and sometimes a difficulty, but I walk with God. Um, and I suppose the issue as well is what do we believe 
prayer is and how does God work in the world now? And of course, therefore, there will be places where there are people starving and there are places where there are people who are affluent. And the question for me is, what am I doing with the resources that has God has given me to be a blessing to others in the world? And how can I best use what I have to feed, but also to change some of those systems to ensure that others are fed as well. And, and I suppose that is the heart of what I say, is what, what do I use that God has given me in the best and wise way? And sometimes I will get that right, and sometimes I will get that wrong. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Somebody has been looking around the audience and says, the average age of this audience seems to be over 50. Can you believe it? My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you think the Church of England could die out in a generation? And if so, what can be done to stop it? Mm. Well, I, I, um, I, I suppose I have a sense that there is hope. I see a lot of hope. And um, the last sort of uh, first two weeks of coming full time to London, I spent going round the diocese of London. And I have seen much things that we should be rejoicing about. There is much hope in London. And in fact, I probably saw more young people than I did older people. Um, and whilst I recognize that there may be skews around older people, there is lots of growth happening with young people. Now, that's not to be complacent. Um, and I do think that the, what we have to recognize is how do we engage with young people? How are we relevant to young people? And of course, one of our challenges is that we have probably now a generation of adults who do not have that cultural Christianity. So their children aren't being born into families who have cultural Christianity. And therefore, the way we are relevant to them has to change. But across London, there are lots of good examples on where that is working well. Saturday in here, uh, messy church, messy cathedral, with what were all young children and young parents. Uh, King's Cross Church, which there has been some press interest with in the last 24 hours. You know, their average age, I think, is something like 29. So much younger people. And so there is a challenge for us to say, how do, we, how do we see what people are doing and how do we spread that good news? And for me, it's not about necessarily uh, numbers in terms of church numbers. For me, it is about the fact that people have found ways of engaging with young people to allow them to come and encounter God and to know the good news of Jesus Christ. And for me, one of the big challenges for the Church of England is what we count at the moment are, is participation of people in pews. And a lot of the way that these chur churches that are growing their young people's work is they're not necessarily encountering, encountering them in pews. They're encountering them in pop-up cafes, uh, in um, different types of venues. And actually, so we have to get, we have to begin to tell those stories as well. And people are account encountering people in, you know, um, dementia cafes, in, uh, you know, homeless shelters. So how do we tell that story as well as our participation in pews? And that, that leads on to a couple of questions about vocation. Um, because the church does talk and, about vocation and people tend to think it means getting a collar around your neck. Um, but of course, lay people have huge vocations, as you know, and that's been your experience. So how can we encourage that engagement with the vocation of the laity? That's one question. And the other is, again, what you've experienced, how people can migrate from the workplace mm. into ministry, mm. so, or that we have more ministers in the workplace, so there's more crossover mm. between those things. Um, my reflection is that I think the Church of England hasn't got this right yet. Um, I think we're learning. Um, as I said, as, I, as you may have heard me say before, I've had one vocation, and that is to follow Jesus Christ. And therefore, at the heart of what I asked was, what does God want me to use my skills for? And, uh, and therefore, that initially was as a nurse. And I can very clearly talk about how I discerned with God how I inhabited that role as a Christian. 
and when I was in the Department of Health working with ministers and civil servants, as in ministers, health ministers, and civil servants, how did I discern what my role was as a, as a Christian in those environments? And in fact, I probably had a more sophisticated theology of that then uh, than, than, you know, that's where I suppose I developed my theology and my understanding of, of incarnation. Um, and then brought that into the role of the priest. And so for me, how do we encourage uh, the church to, one, value people who are in their roles, whether it's in employment, at home, uh, whether they are mums or whether they are retired, to say, actually, you have a vocation. And we want to encourage and affirm you in that vocation, not so you could do a role in a church like a treasurer, but so that you can speak of the love of Jesus Christ. And I think that's about us preaching about it more, teaching about it more, encouraging people to talk about their story, which is why the Ambassadors program in London is so brilliant. You know, to commission people as ambassadors for Christ, I think it's a brilliant thing to be doing. Um, and I also think we probably ought to be enabling people to talk about some of those conflicts they come into, um, you know, they encounter. How do we help people make some of those difficult decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? What can we pray for them for? And, and one of my reflections coming to London is that other parts of the Church of England have had to face sooner the fact that there are less ordained people around for lots of reasons. So calling out lay people, not because you have to, but because actually that's the right thing to be doing. And so in London, I think we have a brilliant opportunity when we still have uh, good numbers of clergy to say, actually, let's build teams that are lay, that are ordained, that are licensed, because actually that's the good of the church, not because we have to. That's because that's what good churches look like. Uh, you're talking in, in some ways in terms of <coughs> laity about how we decentralize the church. Mm. And there's a couple of questions about that question for the church nationally and societally, which you will be very aware of, of course, coming from Devon, mm. which is the Church of England certainly tends to be focused in suburban areas, in cities, <coughs> uh, and in small churches in rural areas, but is facing the pressure in those rural areas. And one of the questions here is, how can we offer spiritual help to churches around the country, mm. so that London is not kind of self-concerned, nor is it looking at its suburban bits, but not mm. at its inner city bits. How do we do that job of sharing the resources mm. that we have? The Diocese of Exeter, which I have just left, has grown for the last two years. And the Bishop of Exeter would want me to tell you that the church in Exeter is in good heart. And, um, you know, some of the villages uh, that I had responsibility for, they had, uh, in a village of 110, they had 100 people at their carol service. So they would have huge participation rates that we would only dream of in London. And so the first thing for me, I think, coming out of a rural diocese is, I think this is about partnership. So they have a lot to teach us, I think, about how you focus contextually. So, so mission for them has become much more intentional. And so they have much, very clear mission action plans now. So they look at their context, they ask what God is calling them to do, and they are very much more intentional about doing it. And they know what it looks like, whatever that is, whether it's engagement in compassionate projects or confidence in speaking the gospel, they'll be very clear. So they are very intentionally locally, and they have had to learn about how you build uh, teams. So I think they have a lot to teach us in London about those sorts of things. However, I think there is no doubt that they struggle to recruit clergy, and they struggle to afford ordinance. So in London, one of my big challenges has been, even now, that we are very well resourced for ordinance and we are very well resourced for clergy. So actually, we could partner. They could teach us something, and maybe what we could do is much more intentionally share those people coming forward for vocation 
and those that we train. So at the moment, we can't place all those that come through ordination training or all those that finish their curacies. So why don't we partner with some of the other dioceses and said we will continue to train, but we will have a relationship with you. And there may well be people who have come from Exeter, they've come up to London, They've found their vocation in London, and actually they may well feel called to go back to Exeter Diocese. So my view is actually we should work in partnership. They teach us, and maybe we share something with them. And that goes for me with this sort of, you know, the cooperation. So we do it in partnership rather than that sense we can give to them resources. And I think there's real opportunities for that. And I, you know, and I think there's some great great opportunities for us to do that partnership and to build it up. And uh, around church growth, one of the questions in relation to that issue of mission and discernment is what, asking what your vision is for the balance between church growth, church planting, and service to everyone in the community. Mm. What's the balance mm. between those? For, for me, I, I believe that you know, we were commissioned to go out uh, and baptize and uh, make disciples of all nations. And if you look at the, uh, the Gospels, that Jesus clearly also uh, went out and healed the sick. Uh, and he did it out of absolute compassion, not always asking for things in return. So for me, there is that sense that we, it goes to goes together. The making of disciples, but also the fact that we are called to be compassionate. We are called to love our neighbors and expect nothing in return. So for me, the sense that Capital Vision here in London has those three things, to speak confidently uh, about Christ, to care compassionately for our community, and to creatively make new disciples. For me, go, it goes together. Um, and so I think for me there is a, a balance of that. And when I'm out and about, I see some people who uh, are much more intentionally intentional about one than the other. And I think that's great because it goes down to context. You know, what is God calling us to do here in this location? Uh, and, uh, and therefore we need to be confident in that calling. But as I said before, I also think we need to think about what is our impact? So not only counting, but also what is our impact? How do we describe it in that way? And talking about impact, uh, one of the questions that's attracting some attention is that question about climate change, described by some health, health experts as a major health issue of the 21st century. Um, and the Diocese of London has had some engagement in, mm. in that issue. How do you see yourself as wanting to lead the church in responding to that issue here mm. in London? I think if you talk to young people about what issues they concer are concerning them, uh, the environment is one of them, you know, one of them on their top list. And I think often we, as an older generation, reflected in this room, um, sometimes I think we forget those the concerns for them. And um, for me, looking at London, the, that you're right that we have done some work within London. Interestingly enough, uh, the, there will be a debate at General Synod that has come up through the diocesan structure here about the responsibility for the environment. So I think we have to take it seriously, not least that some of our church schools are in some of the most polluted areas of the country and of Europe. And so we have to take this seriously uh, for those children that are already in this city um, to enable them to have a positive future. How we do that, um, I think, you know, and what do I offer that? I think my challenge would be to review what we have been doing. Do we know that it's significant? Is it working well? What are the partnerships that we have with people like the mayor? Can we partner up better to get more significant change than we have? But, you know, we are called as Christians to be stewards of God's creation. And I believe we should take that seriously. Okay. Uh, moving on to a few more personal questions. I do. Have you thought of the answer to that naughty <laughs> just, one yet? I'm just such a good person. I have to say, I think the thing that, um, I think the thing that I still still most embarrassed about. You'll, you'll have picked, some of you may have heard this, that my, um, 
after my, almost the week after my announcement, they did a profile program on Radio 4, and my sister got collared to put comments in about me, and most profile programs have these great words of wisdom, and uh, all my sister would tell talk about was the fact that I was banned from playing football with my brother. And the reason for that isn't that I'm bad at football, but I used to kick them in, his friends in the shin purely by accident. So I have to say, I, don't let me near a football pitch. Okay. Um, did you shout amen at the end of Bishop Michael Curry's <laughs> sermon? I did. <laughs> I and why? I did, I did shout amen. Actually, they shout amen, yeah. Why? Because... Uh, I mean, well, you're, you're aware that some people are saying it's, it wasn't a gospel sermon, you know, it was... It was all of that, that well, sort of thing. Well, I just think... Well, uh, what was your view? Well, for me, wedding... I love weddings. One of the challenges being a bishop is you don't take many weddings. Um, you know, and I... They are, weddings are just such happy occasions. And, what, and I just felt, wasn't that a joyful occasion, that the service clearly had been shaped by those two young people. And they were taking seriously the fact that they wanted to get married in the presence of God and in the, their midst of their friends and their family. And they cl clearly had shaped it. And for me, it just reflected them. And one of the wonderful things is there was a wonderful clip, and it, I think it was ITV, one of the presenters said, um, and she clearly came from an Afro-Caribbean background, and she said that she had shed a tear through that sermon because that was the church she grew up in, and she rarely heard it reflected in the media. And I do think one of the challenges for us in London is our church does not reflect the nature of our communities. Our church leaders, 5% of our church leaders come from BAME groups, and that has to change. And for me, that's not just about enabling people from those communities to come through an ordination process where we make them the same as you and me, but it means that it will change the church uh, because we need them to be authentic ministers in the church, and that's about connectivity. So for me, I thought it was a joyous sermon. I think he connected with Meghan Markle and the church that she probably knew um, in that way. Uh, just to, to follow up that question. Um, <laughs> 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 wow. Oh, it's so I must remember to mention the royal wedding more. <laughs> we'll get more know. applause for that one. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the, the other issues which was raised by one of the questioners was that, that sense about how you do include in the church and its ministry in other ways different people of different backgrounds, yeah. and with particular reference to disability, which yeah. of course most of us will experience at some stage in our lives, and for some mm. people, mm. it's a major issue. Yeah. So how can the church be better about including disabled people? Uh, to talk to them. Uh, you know, some of the best services I've attended are those services that have been put together by people with learning disabilities. So it's not about us include them in our service. It's about them working with uh, church leaders uh, to shape a service that they can fully participate in. And that changes the church. And, and so going back to your issue about power, about children, and this for me is the same about our church's um, leadership about BAME as well. You know, if we get these things right, it will change us. And we have to be open to being changed. So for me, about inclusion of people with disabilities is actually it will change us and we have to be open to change. And that sometimes I think is difficult for us. Um, so it's about listening. It's about involving in them in the planning and recognizing actually we will change because of that. Um, you come across as a very calm, measured person. Uh, what makes you angry, and do you ever get angry with God? Yeah, um, it, uh, yeah. Um, yeah I do. I, this, my husband's sitting down at the front row. Um, what makes me angry is being late. <laughs> well, him being late, or you being well, late? Me being late. <laughs> He's, he says I can say this. I have agreed it with him. But, um, um, yeah, it's me. I always get frustrated at being late, um, and I get angry about... I'm very... Uh, interestingly enough, I get angry at myself when I don't do as well as I should have done. 
Um, so, it, so I will go off after this and I will re-examine everything that I've said and done tonight. It will make me angry that I could have done better. So there's something about me and that and myself and my high standards. But I think in terms of um, more sensible anger, um, what makes me angry? I, get, I suppose I get frustrated when the church, when we disagree in a way that is not loving. In a sense, we ought to do better. We talk about a God who is lo loving and we talk about peace. And I believe that peace and peace of the world begins with us finding peace. And actually, we need to find a peace. It does not mean to say we will always agree. It does not mean to say that we will always, um, well, we, we won't agree, but we could do it in love. So it does make me angry when the church, in the broadest sense, cannot a disagree in love. Uh, because I just think we risk losing the heart of the gospel. And in terms of getting angry with God, yes, I think I do get angry with God. Um, I think, you know, to look at some of the tragedy in this world, um, it would be wrong for us not to be angry with God. Um, and I think there's every example of the psalmist and of Job. You know, that is, a, you know, that is something that you see modelled out by other people, you know, far greater than I. And again, how does that then impact on your own prayer life when you have that sense of frustration with how the world is, with how God is? Yeah, I think, you know, I think God is used to us shouting at him and being angry with him. Uh, but for me, that's where the relationship is. You work through your relationship and therefore potentially you are transformed and therefore there is some responsibility for me to carry on. You know, what is it then that I'm going to do with that? You know, what am I going to, what productively will I do that tries to bring about change? And, and, and talking about, you know, I am quite a measured person. And so for me, if I want to bring about change, I will sit down and say, well, where really can I implement, you know, where is my influence? How can I best use what is available to me to bring about that change? And change does not happen overnight. You know, you can look at anything that's changed in our society. Change is hard fought often. And therefore, you have to be in for the long haul as well. And that means about just persistently under, you know, going on about how can I bring about change in a very measured way and not giving up on it. Can I say, there's one of the questions here has picked up the question of collegiality. Mm -hmm. and saying, isn't it one of the attributes that has covered up to powers uh, the way that we've misused our power, the way the church has not acted? How do you avoid collegiality becoming collusion? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think true collegiality is about, is about how you develop a group of people that will work together and will challenge each other. So I do think collegiality in the best sense is the fact that I would expect people to challenge me and to hold me to account so that you are able to be honest and say actually that's not right or that is wrong um, and and I suppose if you if people are talking they're probably talking about the church and collegiality of bishops or covering up of bishops is that I'm very hopeful that you know, uh, we have been doing development, you know, we have been working with each other prayerfully around what does that look like and how do we build on what is good but change what is not so good. Um, and I think that, that we, we're beginning to learn to do that in a different way. And I would certainly hope in London that, you know, I'm very fortunate, going back to one of the early questions, how did I, how did I feel I could say yes? to this role is that there is a very good college of bishops. And so I would hope with them to build on what they do well and develop that environment with, those, uh, with my colleagues where they could challenge me uh, and hold me to account as much as I would challenge them and hold them to account. And of course, as the dean being part of that college, that you could hold me to account and I will hold you to account for what, for what we do and that we can challenge each other but in a way that is right and proper. 
And that means getting challenge onto the agenda. Absolutely. When, on the whole, Absolutely. clergy have had a culture which Absolutely. says we're afraid to be challenged, Absolutely. we're afraid of getting it wrong, so we, we're nice to each other and we don't deal with the difficult. Absolutely. And that goes back to that we have to deal with the difficult. And, and you know, the fact of... And I, and I think, I, you know, I've had some good training over the last three years for this because as a woman... I have had to have those conversations with people to say, I know you don't agree with me, but how are we going to work with each other? And, and I've learnt you, in love, you have to have other courageous conversations. And if you don't, you begin to collude. And actually, it's much better having the conversation than not. Yeah. You know, although it may be tough. So I absolutely agree, you have to have courageous conversations with each other. Uh, one of the questions we've had is, is that question, which person has most inspired you? And in terms of the tasks that you have, is there someone you can draw on for particular inspiration? Mm. Gosh, I mean, I think there are a number of people that um, I think probably have inspired me. Um, and for different reasons, really. I mean, one of the, the one of the people I think of is that the, um, the and I've talked about this a bit in the past. There is a, a ward sister out in Zimbabwe, who a sister Eugenie, who inspired me because she had really very little, and um, and she, you know, for example, she had more. We have more drugs probably in our bath cabinet than she did in her cabinet there, and she was engaging uh, with people. Uh, in really difficult circumstances. And she asked me about what we did around caring for people with HIV uh, and AIDS. And fortunately, before I answered, I had the wisdom to ask her what she did. And um, she had sent, set up a wonderful uh, system where the testing, people were not coming forward to be tested for lots of reasons, stigma, they couldn't get treated. Why? 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 Uh, you know, why be? Why come up for testing if there was no, no benefit? But she'd worked out a system where mothers would come, pregnant mothers, be tested because she could guarantee that she could give them antiretroviral therapy. But along with the test, she gave them a piece of land to farm out the back. So it meant that what she did was not only offer them treatment, but income, because they would lose income, because they were now positive. And um, it set up a self-help group. And so she inspired me that she, and, and this was very prayerful, that her faith had driven her to do this, that she had looked at her context, prayerfully asked how she could bring about change, and she had transformed these individuals' lives. She had taken what she had, and she had just been transformative with it. So I think she's, she's one person that um, has inspired me. Um, the other one that I think inspired me has been Dame Cicely Saunders, uh, in that, you know, here is a woman who successfully, you know, she trained, uh, and, a, and a deep woman of Christian faith, and uh, she trained as a nurse and a social worker and then a doctor, um, and actually then developed this wonderful hospice movement based on the, um, that, that wonderful, wonderful principle of Christian hospitality and that wonderful sense of how you offer hospitality at those most difficult times of people's lives uh, in, that, in that way. But lots of other people. Yeah. And the last question... Uh, Somebody here has asked the question about what success oh, looks like for you. But you might want to put that in a more churchy speak way. <laughs> so um, what's your personal mission statement? Gosh, that's even worse. Um, and what are your key <laughs> performance indicators for reaching them? In other words, I mean, when, you, when you sit here and you look at the task oh. before you, however long the road may be, where do you hope God is going to take this diocese and you? I think, I mean, it's interesting, you know, um, do you know, the one thing I hope that at the end of what, whatever journey this is for me is that I would be able to say that I have been faithful to God. That for me, you know, that, that I think is, for me, that is all, that's what I hung on to, that I can look back and say, I have been faithful to God. That, that would be it for me. Yeah, that that, that's, that's for you. I know. But in, <laughs> I'm asking in relation to the job. 
I think where you would like to see the Diocese of London going, what it, what it would be becoming mm -hmm. in the time that you're here? I, I mean, I think, I suppose I would start, you know, there is such a richness in the Diocese of London, and by that I mean spiritual richness in, in the broadest sense, so that's about depth of spirituality as well as numbers, the way people are being uh, good stewards of what they're doing. And, and you know, that, therefore sometimes I just think, gosh, what do I add to this? You know, because there is a richness. But I would hope that people would, I would hope that we would go on a journey that enables people to say that actually I have deepened my relationship with God, that I have grown in my love of him. And I think that, that if that can take root and people can grow in their faith and love of God, out of that then comes, I think, this desire to share the love of God and that desire to say, what is it that God is calling me? What is it God calling this church that I'm part of to do? So out of that deepening of a spiritual depth, we will see more people transformed by the love of God. And I also hope that, um, so I think that, that I would love to see. And I would also, I suppose, a bit for me, say, actually begin to see this developing of this culture that is m much more growing in collegiality, growing in love, although we may differ, that we still love. And that sense of holding that diversity of London. Because for me, the unity of London is seen in its diversity. And I would hope that that's what we will continue to see grow. Sarah Mullally, 133rd <laughs> Bishop for London. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Two, two things to finish with. One is an apology. Um, is that to me? Uh, my, my bosses over in the corner there tell me that um, we've never had as many questions as we have had tonight. And we're very sorry if we didn't get to ask yours. But thank you very much for your participation and engagement. And the other is simply to ask Sarah to send us away with her blessing. Let us pray. May the God of all hope give you joy and peace in believing. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Um, we'll be around for the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, may God bless you and go with you. Thank you very much for coming.